I can't tell you how many times people have said to me over the years, have you done the Tour de France? And I have to kind of explain, well, you know, I did a version. It was called Tour Cycliste Feminine. And my riders get it all the time. Have you done the Tour de France? And they've had to say, no, there is no Tour de France for women. Finally, there is. There's a Tour de France for women. So all of my riders that are in this race this year will, will be able to say to their kids someday, I race the Tour de France. And that's incredibly powerful. Welcome to the Canadian Cycling Magazine podcast. I'm Matthew Piaro, and with me is Matt Hansen. How's it going, Matt? Real super. Super, eh? Well, that's mm. good to hear. It's Friday. Can we say it's Friday? No, because this is airing on a Thursday. Darn it. It's Thursday. It's Bastille Day. Sorry, it's Thursday. Happy Thursday, everyone. Happy Bastille Day. We're out in the backyard uh, outside of our office. The birds are... I asked them to be quiet. They're chirping us. They're really chirping us. Quite literally. Huh. Anyway, this is a little different. Usually we're in our respective uh, recording studios. Yep, those high-tech studios we have here at Canadian Cycling Magazine. That's right. Uh, how are you feeling? Pretty good. You know, I'm looking forward to Friday tomorrow, which will be the beginning of the weekend since it's Thursday today. So do you know, of course you know, but on this episode, I have, I speak with Action Jackson. Which one? Good question. Because what Action Jackson comes to mind, or do you think comes to mind when I say that? Not the current Action Jackson. And not Carl Weathers' character from the 1988 film. No. But I mean, it, it is funny to me when I started reading about Allison Jackson, when I saw her calling herself Action Jackson, I immediately said, wow, that's Linda. Linda Jackson. And that's who we have on the show today. Linda Jackson. For fans of Canadian cycling who maybe, who's, uh, who haven't been in it that long, um, Linda Jackson is a very important figure. Um, in 2015, uh, in the magazine, we called her one of the 15 most important Canadians in cycling. And Matt, I'm sure you, you can fill us in on why the, we, we picked her. I mean, I think that she, you know, 20 years ago, whatever it was, she, she was one of the you know, along with people like Sue Palmer or um, Alison Sider, she was one of the most recognized Canadians out there. I, I still have this image of her winning one of many races, Tour de Lode or the uh, the Nationals. And she's, I can just see her riding this wicked Cannondale when she rode for Timex Cannondale, the same that Mario Cipollini had, and wearing her national championship jersey. And she was just, just a, a sight to see, you know, an aggressive rider, always doing well on the international stage. That's true. And then she had a second act to her career. In uh, 2004, she started the team we, we most often refer to as TIBCO SVB. It recently became EF Education TIBCO SVB. And it has been um, quite the significant force in women's cycling, especially uh, developing, uh, developing riders and getting them to the next level often, um, including Allison Jackson. <laughs> who did a stint on that team. Which is kind of nice. I think it's neat, too. And it's sort of a testament to any of these, you know, whenever someone's... She was obviously... She had a very successful business career, which she used that same perseverance in cycling. And I think also that is why this team has gone from a relatively small team to now, you know, one of the best in the world. I think that's a tribute to her perseverance because it's probably not easy getting funding for a bike team, especially women's teams. And she's, she's done it. So the occasion for this... This chat with Linda Jackson is, of course, the Tour de France Femme. It is starting not too long from now, not too long from when this podcast airs. It is a big deal because it's eight stages. It's an ASO event. Um, you know, the ASO has given given women um, something like the, the the course by La Tour. And but this is this is a big deal because now we have a stage race. And it's also called the Tour de France. For once. For once. That's right. Not, uh, what, what are some of the other incarnations it had? Like Grande Boucle Feminine. Actually, we, we don't get into this in the, in the podcast, but the, one of the other reasons I wanted to talk to Linda was that 25 years ago, she raced, um, Tour Cycliste Feminine. 
And at that particular edition, she was third. She was on the podium. It's kind of a women's Tour de France, but it wasn't connected with the tour officially. There was one that was connected to the tour that ran from about 84 to 89. But uh, the race that um, Linda Jackson did in uh, 97, as well as uh, I think she first did it in 94, that was a stage race, but uh, it wasn't quite officially, it wasn't officially at all the Tour de France. Yeah, I think that's important recognition too, uh, that that the ASO has come on board and they're not worried about, you know, trademark infringement. They actually want to embrace the race and let women, you know, race the best race in the world. It's exciting. Also on this episode, we have a scoop. At least I hope it's still a scoop. She revealed the lineup for EF Education, Tibco SVB at the Tour de France Femme. Um, I'm not going to reveal who it is, but uh, it comes comes later on in the... Can I reveal it? Well, I hope you've written a story that's come out right now <laughs> to match the, the launch of this podcast. But um, yeah, so that's exciting because this news is coming out and we're all looking forward to that tour. Um, so why don't we get into uh, Linda's conversation about the old not official tour, the upcoming official tour, and her career as a cyclist. Linda Jackson. Soon, your team, EF Education Tibco SVB, is heading to the Tour de France Femme. But before we talk about that race, I want to go back 25 years to the Tour Cycliste Feminine. What do you remember about that 12-stage race in 1997 that you competed in? I remember a really difficult race. I remember incredibly long transfers. So back then, you know, it was a smallish type race from, from a funding perspective. And so there were great distances between the cities. So we would, you know, have to finish our race, get in the car, drive for several hours. I remember tough, tough courses. And the most, the biggest thing I remember is I was sitting in third place overall. And it was a double day for the last day. And in the morning, I managed to crash myself by taking a feed bag that was too heavy. I thought it was going to be one water bottle. It was two. Swung it into my front wheel, went head over the handlebars, and then had to race in the afternoon as well. And in the afternoon stage, I suffered because of the crash in the morning. I went as hard as I can, and I got I had a dismal race. And the girl that was sitting in fourth place behind me, Valentina Polkanova, she beat me that day, and I held on to the podium by seven seconds. Um, so it, I, that's what I remember most of all. You mentioned it was it was tough in terms of like logistical uh, support. I'm guessing there were no team buses back then. Oh, <laughs> we did not have a team bus, no. You know, I think this race in 97, I'm pretty sure I raced it with the Canadian national team. I'm, I'm positive I did. We had a little team car. A little team, uh, not a bus, a van, and we all squeezed in there. And the conditions really were ter- horrific. I mean, we had long neutral stages uh, before the race started. We'd have a long neutral section, super hot weather. You know, I already mentioned the distances between transfers, but I am still so grateful we had that race. I mean, the organizer did what they could. And they put on the race for us. And I will tell you, I'm sure every single woman that did the Tour Cycles Feminine was glad they had the opportunity to race the races we did. We raced some incredible mountains. And, uh, you know, I will, it's a highlight of my life that I'll never, ever forget. What was media coverage like, or even how many spectators came out to watch? There were hardly any spectators. I remember some old men at the side of the road yelling, yay, les filles, les filles. (laughs) Um, And they were a handful of them. There were not many. No, it wasn't, you know, from what I remember, it was not, you know, there were not many spectators. Media coverage, pretty non-existent. You know, you might have the cycling websites and stuff, but there was there was nothing on TV that I recall. It was, you know, that's what's so exciting. And I'm sure we'll talk about the ASO race here, but that's what's so exciting about this opportunity is that we're finally we're finally seeing some media coverage. In 1997, where were you at in terms of your cycling career? I quit my career as an investment banker in 1993. 
I was a vice president at an investment bank. And I quit that to see how far I could go in cycling and went to the Olympics in 96. And then 97 and 98 were two of my best years. I was 39 and 40, respectively. So that's kind of where I was. I, my last year racing was 99. So I would say in 97 and 98, I was, I was at the top of my career. 99 was a tough year. I got a lung infection and I just never hit my stride. And then I retired in early 2000. You kind of touched on uh, the Tour de France Femme. And I want to actually contrast that. What do you expect with this upcoming ASO race? Uh, how? <laughs> I mean, I think this is maybe too broad of a question now. How do you expect it to be different from the one you did in the 90s? So the thing about ASO, it's number one, it's so exciting that they have committed to this race. It's been a long time in coming. I think we had our first ASO one day Tour de France. Was it 2010? It might have been 14. Oh, was it 2014? Okay. And it was, you know, one day for several years. Then they had two days and then it went back to one day. So this is a huge commitment from ASO to do an eight day race. And it will be incredibly well organized. These guys, when they put on a race, it's really well organized. Their team and the riders are really well taken care of, and they will have terrific media exposure. That's what's so exciting about this race. You started your team, Tibco SVB, in 2004. This past fall, EF Education First came on as title sponsor, or one of the title sponsors, I should say. That's a familiar name. EF Education First owns the men's world team but it doesn't own the women's team. Can you go into more detail about the connections between EF, the company, and the men's team, and your team? Sure, yeah, there's a lot of confusion around that. So EF Education owns the men's team. EF Education came on as a co-title sponsor for my team. So they've joined long-running partners, TIPCO and Silicon Valley Bank, They've joined those two as a co-title sponsor. So we have three co-title sponsors. And I think for EF Education, we were a natural fit. You know, I'm pretty sure they wanted in for the first Women's Tour de France. That's a big draw for a lot of people. But for EF, it was a natural fit because their employee base is 60% women. They're into travel. So obviously, they're a good fit with the men's team. It just was logical for them to have a women's team. So it was a really good fit for a couple of other reasons. And that's that um, I am terrible at marketing. I did my MBA at Stanford. And to me, marketing is something that has to get done, but I'm not good at it. You know, EF does a terrific job with marketing. You probably just saw the Rafa Palace kit roll out. That's, that's a big part, EF, getting that together. So it's they do a really good job with all the marketing. The second reason why it's really good fit is they've been, the EF men's team has been really big in gravel and off-road events, that's been our natural tendency too. So we, you know, have been doing gravel for years. We were big into Zwift during COVID. You know, we're not, we're, we're willing to, to move around and try different disciplines. And I think EF is off the beaten track that way too. So those are a few of the main reasons why it was a great fit with EF. Organizationally, there's no overlap. We don't share infrastructure. We don't share service courses. They're really two separate, completely separate teams. I do get a lot of great advice from a lot of the people on men's team have been around for a long time, so I can leverage their advice, which is great. But other than that, there's no sharing of infrastructure or anything like that. And things have changed quite a bit since EF has come on. Um, the, the team is now a world team. What are other significant changes that have, have happened since EF has come on? Well, EF coming on was really the impetus was to go world tour. So they wouldn't have come on if we weren't world tour. This was all to get a world tour license. To get a world tour license, you have to already have a continental team. You can't just go get a world tour, tour license. So it made a lot of sense for EF to, to, to approach an existing team to do this. So, so two of the additional uh, major changes to EF coming on, the most important one I would say is it was really important to EF and to Cannondale, our bike partner, that we uh, match men's minimum salaries. You know, there's a lot of teams announcing different things, but there's a woman's minimum, 
there's a pro team men's minimum, and then there's a men's world tour minimum. And we've gone all the way from uh, the woman's minimum, I think is 40,000 euros. The men's world tour minimum is 65,000 euros and the pro team is somewhere in between. We went all the way up and matched the men's minimum. So all of our world tour riders are making the men's minimum salary, which is a huge difference. It basically doubles your salary budget or almost, right? Probably 75% higher or something like that. So that was a huge commitment. And then another big change is that our staff has grown so much. I mean, my current general manager, Rachel Hederman, was our director last year, one director, and she did almost the same calendar as two directors are doing this year. We had one mechanic, one Swanee, and a director. And this year we've got, you know, a high performance director. We've got two full-time directors. We've got to have bus drivers. We've got a couple of mechanics, a couple of soigneurs. Our staff has probably tripled. At camp this year, we had almost as much staff as we did, as we did riders. So it, it's a huge jump. And I say to myself, how did we get by for so long with just a director, a mechanic, and a swanee? And I still don't understand it. But when when you when you add a bus into the picture, you got to have a bus driver. If you have a bus driver, you need to have another Swanee because the bus driver can't, you know, go to the feed zone. So it's incredibly complicated. It adds a lot of staff and it adds a lot of expense. There's a big difference between how we ran this team for 17 years, which was on a shoestring budget, to how we're running it now, which still feels like a shoestring budget because there's so many expenses. But um, yeah, it's a big difference. We're speaking in early July, ahead of the Tour de France Femme. How would you characterize the team season so far? I'm really proud of how the team has has performed so far. I was actually pretty surprised. We uh, finished the, the deal with EF fairly late in the summer last year. So, you know, we didn't do a lot of recruiting. So we had basically the riders we had with, you know, a few, a couple more added. And a lot of these are riders were young riders. My expectation wasn't that high this year and I didn't want to put pressure on the riders. I really wanted to give them the opportunity to develop. And I think that we have outperformed, for sure we've outperformed what I expected this year. We really hit our stride. The classics were really difficult for us. We didn't have a classic squad. We're focused on building that now. Classics are a different animal, right? But we've hit the stage races now, and we've got a couple of really good climbers. Uh, we're suffering right now in the Giro, but but that's another story. So I, I think we've outperformed what I expected. We've had some win. I think we, I don't know how many wins. We've had a couple of wins. We've had, you know, some podium results. We've done well in the stage races. And that's really my interest. As much as I know we need to have a classics presence, I'm a, I was a stage racer and I love stage racing. And that's always kind of, you know, been my emphasis with this team is stage racing. So I'm, I'm proud. I'm proud of how the girls have done so far. As a continental team, Tibco SVB had a strong emphasis on development. Now, as the team is at the world team level, which is new for this year, there's still a significant focus on development. But do you think that might change? Do you think there might be pressure to get results and then the development will have to be something you juggle? You're spot on. I think it's very challenging to maintain development at the world tour level. You know, we've, it's been our focus for 18 years is to find the talent that's new and, and get them onto the team. People like Kristen Faulkner last year, it was her, you know, was the year before it was her first year racing. And we found her, brought her on, and she's an amazing talent. And um, and Veronica Ewers, who's on our team this year, same thing. Brand new talent, incredibly, really, really strong. But she's a new rider. And so those riders, they're going to get results because they're so strong, but they take a little while to develop. I will always try and find those riders. That's my excitement about doing what I do, is to find those riders that are going to be really good riders, but you can't do many of them at the world tour level because you can only have, I think the average roster size is 13 riders. It's an expensive proposition now to run a world tour team. You know, it's, 
10 times more expensive than what our budget was maybe five years ago, you know, or seven, eight years ago. So yes, it's hard to juggle the development. I, I'll always look for that special rider and bring her in. But, um, you know, to have more than a handful on the team is tough because we're also doing gravel uh, and other things. So it gets very challenging. And that's why I invested in Jennifer Wheeler's team, the Fount Cycling Guild, this year, and I'm supporting them next year, is because I really wanted to maintain a focus on development. And I knew my hands would be kind of tied at the world tour level. Are you going to be planning to acquire uh, talent instead of developing it? You'll be acquiring it, acquisitions, instead of um, building up uh, internally? I tell you what, there's intense wage pressure on the top riders. The problem we have in the Women's World Tour right now is that there's going to be 15 teams at, let's say, 14 riders a team. That's over 200 riders. That There's no depth in the Women's World Tour. So what that means is, you know, you have maybe 20 strong riders or 30. I'd have to look at the rankings. But then it's it falls pretty dramatically. So the wage pressure to acquire a top rider, it's it's insane. I mean, it's a good thing for women cycling. Women are starting to see salaries they've never seen before. But if you're a team like me that's, you know, not one of the top three budget teams, it's awfully hard to acquire top talent. We'll continue to look for the rider that sees value in being on our team, that appreciates the things that we have and that we offer. Because I think, you know, we do have a reputation for developing riders and and being concerned about the development path of riders. So I think that's always going to help us. But it'll be tough to compete for a top, top, top rider. And and that's never been my MO. Like I I really don't want to buy them. I'd rather develop them. But it but it's awfully painful when you want to develop them and then you lose them. So is there a race that can change a rider's career just by her participating in it? You know, that's an interesting question. And I and you know the logical one to think would be the women's tour de France. I don't think so. Not at the end of the day, the Women's Tour de France is just another race. But okay, what about the Olympics? Because that was an important event in your career. Yes, it certainly was. But but I don't know that it changes a career path. I mean, I will never forget the Olympics. That was incredibly important to me. The road race was very disappointing to end up on the ground after, you know, giving up my career and putting everything into making the Olympic team. That was incredibly disappointing. It's still, it's just imprinted in my brain as an incredible experience. And like the woman's Tour de France, I'll never forget it. So it was very valuable to me. And I, it's a memory that I'll always have. And I can picture my parents there with me right now and they're gone. So that's also incredibly sentimental. It didn't change my career path though. You know, I think you, you look at the woman that won the Olympic road race last year. I mean, she's, I don't even, I'm sure she's racing some time trials somewhere, but I don't think it changed her career. Is it important to you to send your riders or to encourage your riders to get to the Olympics? Oh, absolutely. A women, I think for women, the Olympics is the end all be all. It's, we still are in this era where women are doing this out of passion and you know, that may change as more money comes into the sport. I think we're a few years away from that yet, but it, it probably will change. But for the most part, women are doing this out of passion, not to make, not to get rich, not to make, make a bunch of money to support their family. You know, I would say overall, women have a background of, you know, an education or a career before they find cycling. I really feel that the, the Olympics is the ultimate goal. It has been in the past more than a three-week Tour de France. It's the one goal that women really shoot for. And to be able to call yourself an Olympian is a pretty proud thing. You know, it's not something that a lot of people get to do. So I'm always encouraging a rider's attempts to make the Olympics, but it's also only three or four women go. So they have to be doing it for a different reason other than just to make the Olympics, because that is a real long shot. This episode of the Canadian Cycling Magazine podcast is supported by MS Bike. Did you know that Canada has one of the highest rates of MS in the world? 
One in 400 Canadians lives with MS. You can help those with MS by participating in an MS bike event. Not only is there some great riding to do, but fundraising as well, which does make a difference. Soon, there's the Grand Bend to London ride in Ontario. In early August, there's the Annapolis Valley event on some prime Nova Scotia roads. These and all other MS bike events are great for new and seasoned cyclists alike. All of you can get cool rewards such as MS bike t-shirts, shorts, and new this year, MS bike jackets to round out the kit. So head to msbike.ca, register, and start fundraising now. Your Twitter handle is Action LJ, Action Linda Jackson. There's another Action Jackson out there. Allison Jackson, who was on Tibco SVB in 2018 and 2019. She also has action in her social media handles. So my question, does a Jackson just borrow the action from the future generation? (laughs) <laughs> so when Allison was on the team, I was like, look, I was the first Action Jackson, okay? <laughs> I was the first one. And I'll tell you a funny story. I was on Zwift last last winter, and I don't do Zwift often. It has to be raining to get me to get me on Zwift. But I got on this group ride and this person, my 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 Zwift is what is my Zwift? I think it's just AJ for Action Jackson. And this guy wrote in, he said, hey, Allison, you know, are you getting ready for such and such a race? And I thought, whoops, (laughs) maybe I should change my my Zwift name. Um, Yeah, but we've always been confused on social media stuff. Yeah. Is there any connection to Action Jackson, the 1988 film starring Carl Weathers? No, no. People called me Action Jackson in, you know, I don't, I guess in, in school and stuff, somehow I got the nickname. And then they called me Action LJ. And so for me, there was no connection, but there probably was with people that were calling me that. So it just stuck. How much riding are you you doing now? You mentioned Zwift, but um, what about getting out on the roads? So I refuse to let my age limit me in riding. I try not to acknowledge my age. But I'll tell you, this year, I ride a lot. I ride, you know, five, six days a week, and I ride probably 300 miles a week. That was pre-COVID. I got COVID about a month ago, and that's really slowed me down, but I'm trying to get back out there. But I will continue riding as long as I can. Don't even suggest an electric bike to me when I slow down, because I will fight that tooth and nail. Uh, I love riding my bike, and I'm going to stay riding as long as I can. Recently on social media, you posted that... um... Banking and biking have always been a great mix. You mentioned uh, their, your career as an investment banker, which you, you left behind for cycling. But uh, can you tell me more about how those two things have mixed for you at various times? Well, for me, you know, I basically gave up our banking for biking. And it was, I tell you, it was awfully hard to go back and reverse seven years later after my cycling career to go from biking back into banking. (laughs) Um, But what I've seen since I've been retired from the sport and now on the business side of things is how much those two things are intertwined. I mean, here in Silicon Valley, most CEOs ride, venture capitalists ride. You know, you probably saw the, I don't know if you saw the article in The Economist years ago, you know, cycling is new golf. There have been other articles on that. I mean, cycling is just such a great social networking opportunity for business. And I gave a lecture at SBB years ago now to a crowd full of venture capitalists on lessons that were applicable from sport back into business. And it's just, you know, it's there's such an amazing um, synergy between the two. There's just so many lessons that you take back into business. And that's one thing that I, I really think is important for women is what they've learned from cycling. I mean, I, as an investment banker, since I've been cycling and then back into this end of things, I am a much more confident person than I was in, as an investment banker. 
I just think sport and achievement and leadership skills that you that you learn in, in sport, it's just so transferable to business. I think that's another good thing for, for young women in terms of their development. But there's just a huge overlap, you know, between all the work we do at Silicon Valley Bank, for instance, with Best Buddies, which is a nonprofit that they support. We do every year. There's just a great overlap between business and biking. Women's cycling has grown a lot in the past five, even 10 years. What do you think of the pace of that change? Is it too fast, too slow, just right? So women's cycling has really grown in the last five, 10 years for sure. I personally think that that we need to pause and consolidate. What does that mean to pause and consolidate? Well, so the UCI has pushed through a lot of changes. And to their credit, I think they've really done a good job of getting women's cycling to where we are today with, you know, first the women's salaries. And then I think it's going to be mandatory in a couple of years, maybe even next year, to pay the same minimum as the men's. But I'm not sure if that's a world tour men's or the pro team team men's. But they've, they've really pushed the women's development side of things with the development of the world tour. At the beginning, I was just thinking, oh, this is just a repackaging of the World Cups. But it isn't. There's a lot of requirements that you have to fulfill to be a World Tour team. And I think the UCI, you know, I reluctantly admit that the UCI has done a great job in in um, in pushing that along. I think that right now, though, it's like we can't, as a team, right? we can't be pushed much further right now. You know, if, if they put more requirements on us that are in terms of budget and stuff, it's um, we're 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 kind of maxed out right now. And I, I know I speak for a lot of teams. I think there are several more teams, too, that would would really like to just pause and say, OK, let's get our feet underneath us here. <laughs> um, there's some new races, for instance, coming up that have been added to the World Tour, which I welcome because I love the Australian races. So that's going to be great to start our season off in Australia. But that's an additional races on the calendar. That's an additional budget. You know, there's the UAE tour. With our roster size of 14 right now, which we can't really afford to go higher, you know, we're pretty maxed out. So uh, with the calendar, with COVID, you know, that's really reduced our roster. No one thought COVID would still be with us. COVID's had a huge expense impact on the team. You know, it's had a huge uh, roster impact on the team. So I think, and I'm sure every other team, so I just think right now, it's like, okay, there's one more team to join World Tour status, and that'll make the 15 licenses will be all gone. And then I think they sure as heck better not are to open up to more teams because, you know, there's we need to broaden the base of the pyramid, get more riders into the sport, I think, before we go much further. Returning to the Tour de France Femme, what do you think that race can do for women's cycling? So I really think that the success of the Tour de France Femme, how successful it is, is going to make or break women's cycling for the next 10, 12 years. My expectation is that we're going to have a great race, full of great race, like, you know, exciting racing, and that we'll get the media exposure and that we're off to the races, so to speak. You know, I think we're at an inflection point. And I really think that a successful Tour de France femme will drive the growth of women's cycling even further because we finally have the media exposure that we need for the sport. So I think this is going to be hugely important. My personal feeling is that this event, this race this year, could change the face of women's cycling, not just next for the next year or two, but for the next generation. I think that it could have a really long impact on the growth of the sport. So it's, it's incredibly important. This event is incredibly important. Yeah, that is a lot of weight for one race. But like, it makes sense. The Tour de France, say on the men's side, it is the event of the calendar. And it just monopolizes for good or for bad so much attention. I can't tell you how many times people have said to me over the years, have you done the Tour de France? And I have to kind of explain, well, you know, I did a version. It was called Tour Cycles Feminine. And my riders get it all the time. Have you done the Tour de France? And they've had to say, no, there is no Tour de France for women. Finally, there is. There's a Tour de France for women. So all of my riders that are in this race this year will will be able to say to their kids someday, I raced the Tour de France. And that's incredibly powerful. 
Is there anything the race can't do? We ha- you have these expectations or these predictions for its significance, but is there anything that maybe we shouldn't be looking for this race to, to do or to accomplish? Well, I don't think that, that this race can change women's cycling overnight. So I don't think we should be looking for, you know, a huge spike in cycling in women's cycling over one year. So I, I think, you know, it's a good point. We're all saying, oh, this is so important. This race is so important. And it is, but it's one step of the in the process. Which of the eight stages are you most looking forward to? You know, I haven't I haven't delved into the stages completely. I should because I'm going to ride every stage um, the same day that the women race them. I've got a group of supporters coming over, and we're all going to try and get to the finish line before we're kicked off the course. We have to stay ahead of the caravan. And it leaves an hour before the women leave. So um, it's going to be challenging. But there's no question the last stage, um, Planche des Filles or something. Yeah, La Planche de Belle Fille, yeah. Yeah, de Belle Fille. That's going to be ex- an exciting stage for sure. You know, I'm not so into the 175K flat windy stage. We don't have those kind of riders. We don't have a pure sprinter. So, you know, definitely the hilly stages are the ones that I'm excited about. Are you able to reveal who the team is sending to the Tour de France Femme? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to do that. You know, it's not public yet, but I've got a soft spot for Canada and Canadian cycling. So I'm, I'm happy to let you know who it is. We are definitely bringing our two climbers. So Krista Dobell Hickok and Veronica Ewers. They'll be there. Really good climbers. We've got a good experienced teammate in Catherine Hams from Ger- Germany. We've got Letizia Borghese from Italy. She's a good little group sprinter. Sarah Poitevin from Canada will be there. And the sixth spot is Emily Newsom. Emily is a mother of a six or seven-year-old daughter and is doing a lot of the gravel events in the U.S. this year, but she's the consummate teammate, and we uh, gave her a spot for the, for the tour. Thank you for sharing that with us. That's a pretty cool lineup. Yeah, we're, we're pretty exciting. It's obviously everybody wanted to do the race, but um, you can only take six, so... It was a tough, tough decision. What are your hopes for your riders and your team at the Tour de France Femme? I'm first of all hoping that they they can calm down and realize this is just another bike race and not get all stressed out about it. Because one thing I learned, I had a very short cycling career, but and one thing I didn't learn until year four or five of six was six or seven was that the calmer you are in a race, the greater your likelihood of performing well. You've got to be calm to be able to read a race. You know, stress causes all kinds of bad out- bad outcomes. Um, so my, I would hope that they can stay calm, stay focused. Don't look ahead to the climbing stage when you're at stage one. Just take it stage by stage. We have a couple of really good climbers, and I think that they'll perform well in the climbs. I don't think we'll be shooting for an overall result at this race. You know, it's, it's just too early for a development team, but I think we have capability to do well on some of the hilly stages. So that's, that's what I expect to see. And I, and I would also expect to, I want to see the team ride like a unit and really, you know, race well and not be intimidated into sometimes what you can see in cycling as a new race or a new stage or something, people just kind of back off and they're too intimidated. I want them to know they belong there and that they they can do well there and have them race like like I know they can race. Well, Linda, thank you for your time. Um, I'm looking forward to this race. I know a lot of our listeners are looking forward to this race. Um, I hope you enjoy it. Also, I hope you enjoy trying to keep ahead of it while it's on and you enjoy riding in France once again. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it too. And that's the episode. It is written and edited by me, Matthew Piaro. I had help from Matt Hansen. Thank you, Matt Hansen. A lot of help. A lot of help. That's right. Pretty well, much all I do is help. Your big help. It was super helpful. Well, I, that's all I do. Help, help, help. Well, I think, but you need the 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 
the Pro Cyclist Super modifier. It was super help. Yeah, because right now that's what I'm doing again, doing a lot of big bike races like the midweek B race. How's that going, your little roundy rounds? Well, I know you have told me if I don't win one, I'll be fired. So I'm working on that. You said that several times. I don't remember saying that, but I don't know. Maybe this is a performance bonus. Yeah. I mean, I'm pretty sure the prize money is fantastic there. I mean, we let's not slag it. That is a great event. Yeah, it is a great event. Uh, big ups, uh, midweek cycling for, for continuing to put that on. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe you're just not in the right breakaway. Well, I can't, the problem is I can't get in a breakaway. That, I mean, I've gotten to one, and then I, I couldn't pull through. So I, I got to really focus on staying in the breakaway. I can oh, make the breakaway. Right, 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 it's right, just right, the right. staying is the hard part. All right. Well, you're working it out. We also need to thank uh, web editor Terry McCall for his help. This uh, episode is produced by Adam Killick, and he composed the music, too. Um, thanks to Ontario Creates for its support. Matt, what is up for you? You got something coming up? A little project? You're heading north of the, the city? Midweek? Oh, no, that. Oh, right, yeah, right. Yeah, remember uh, yeah, I'm going your work, your oh, actual right. work assignment? You, mid- racing is kind of work. No. It's cycling related. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always leave early to go to it. Yeah, I guess you haven't noticed that on my Strava. That's a problem. Oh, okay. Um, I am going to Hardwood Hills for the uh, Cross Country Nationals. That's right. You're going to be there. Um, Matt Stetson is going to be Two out of three Matts from yep. here are going to be there. Yeah. Represent. Covering that. I did some heavy lifting though. I brought uh, the Canadian Cycling banner there. It's already there for you. Really? Yeah. Well, that was it's nice going to be you. up there. Well, um, do I have to walk around with it? No, no, like no. Like a walking billboard kind of thing? No, no. The billboard will be just, it should be against the barriers. It'll, it should be unfurled. Do I, do I have to wear a Canadian Cycling golf shirt? <sighs> do you have one? Nope. All right. Well, let's dig one up for you. <laughs> we'll get one for you. All right. Thank you for listening, everyone. Please rate and review the show. Ride safely. And I'll talk to you later. Bye.